Good afternoon. I'm going to get us started. My name is Sandro Galea, and I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. On behalf of our school, welcome. Before we begin, a word, a word of thanks to everybody who helped make today happen, in particular Meredith Brown and Alicia Noel, as well as uh, a co-partnership with our Environmental Health Department, Professors John Levy and uh, Greg Wallen is here, here from, hearing from in a few minutes, as well as Professor Patrick Kinney. Thank you to all. Today is a part of a series of events we are hosting on the coronavirus. This pandemic is evolved, unfolding rapidly, giving little time to reflect. These events are meant to produce such time, helping contextualize COVID-19 through the lens of contemporary public health issues. COVID-19 has shown how when we ignore the structures to generate poor, poor health, we become vulnerable to crisis. Today, it is a pandemic. Tomorrow, it could be the manifestations of climate change. The social, political, and economic conditions that slowed our pandemic preparedness overlap with the conditions slowing our response to climate change. In addition, changes we have brought about to mitigate the coronavirus also have cast light on what it is that drives change in climate, teaching us lessons that may serve us well to deal with the challenges of climate change in coming years. We are honored today to have an outstanding panel with us to discuss these interesting and rich set of issues. Each panelist will speak for about 10 minutes and then I shall moderate questions from the audience. Please feel free to use the question tab in your Zoom browser and I will do my best to get to as many questions as we can. Without further ado, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Mona Sarfati, Director of the Program for Climate and Health at George Mason, Mason University's Center for Climate Change Communication. Professor Sarfati. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to speak today. I'm really delighted uh, to do this and to be part of this seminar. Um, we are, I'm the di director of an organization called the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health, and we're comprised of 29 medical societies, which together represent over 600,000 physicians and have 44 affiliated public health groups that uh, we are closely aligned with that have millions of members. The mission of the consortium is to organize, empower, and amplify the voices of America's doctors and other health professionals to educate the public and policymakers about how climate change is harming our health and how climate solutions can improve it. So today's seminar is to talk about coronavirus and climate. And of course, we've all now for the last several months been experiencing the pandemic that has virtually turned our lives upside down. So I'm gonna speak first about how to think about climate change in the light of the COVID-19 crisis, and then talk a little bit about the health emergency of climate change, some of the bad news and the good news on addressing climate change, and then turn to the policy action agenda, which is climate solutions that we've put forward that are also health solutions. So if we compare the threat of climate change and the threat of COVID-19, there's some very interesting conclusions to draw. First of all, COVID-19 exposes the danger of ignoring the experts and ignoring data. COVID-19 and climate change are both very real health emergencies, although different speeds and rates. Both will cause millions of deaths worldwide, but COVID-19 in days to months and climate change in months to years. Both are crises of environmental origin. And we found out that the public needs accurate and scientifically sound information to protect their health. We have to listen to the experts and the public needs to hear from the experts. Of course, we all knew that before, but it has been underscored in a very dramatic way over the last month. Pre preparedness and prevention save lives. We know that our government failed to maintain the public health capacity required to properly respond to COVID-19. So strengthening public health must be a priority to, pro to protect against emerging health threats. Across America, we have already experienced dangerous climate-related heat waves, floods, wildfires, hurricanes, and emerging infectious diseases. So strengthening our public health infrastructure must be a priority to protect health in the face of these and multiple emerging health threats. We have the technology and the know-how to rapidly reduce climate pollution at this time. Reducing climate pollution will also save hundreds of thousands of American lives each year by cleaning our air and our water and thus reducing heart and lung disease, especially amongst the most vulnerable. 
It will also save money in healthcare costs and increase our productivity. The health of the world's haves and have nots are very intertwined. So cooperative action is essential. Many communities that have been the most impacted by climate change are innovators and leaders on climate and health solutions that will benefit all of us. We should ex be extending ourselves to get in touch with them, to listen and learn from them. The pathology of American racism is making the pathology of the coronavirus much worse. As with COVID-19, the impact of climate change on vulnerable, vulnerable minority communities is made worse by the terrible toll of inequalities on communities that breathe dirtier air and have less access to health services. Heavily polluted air that doesn't meet EPA standards exists across the country, but is often worse in minority neighborhoods. To understand disinvestment, all we have to do is look at the states that have not expanded Medicaid. This is a pretty dramatic picture, especially for states that have expanded Medicaid. But across the country, many people are living essentially without access to health services. Climate change impacts health in a number of ways. I'm assuming that most of this audience is already familiar with this, but through extreme heat, heavy rains and floods, droughts and fires that cause air pollution, mosquitoes and tick-borne diseases, threats to nutrition and food security, threats to clean water and threats to mental health, people across the country are being harmed now by climate change. The health of any American can be harmed by climate change, but some face greater risk than others. That includes children and students who spend a lot more time outside, pregnant women who are more vulnerable to heat and to poor air quality, the elderly who are especially vulnerable to heat, people with chronic illnesses and allergies, and people with limited resources, especially people of color who have experienced environmental uh, injustice in the past. So what about the costs of climate change? Well, health costs are only starting to be characterized and an analysis based on case studies estimated the health cost of 10 climate sensitive events in 2012 as $10 billion. The health costs added about 25% to the cost of those events and 64% of that was, pay, was paid by Medicare and Medicaid. In 2019, the Minnesota Health Department looked at the costs of suboptimal temperatures. They found that the excess cost was $9.4 billion a year. This was mostly due to cold, as it turns out. Older people were more subject to impacts of cold and the younger people were more subject to the impacts of heat. And this, this really emphasizes for us how important weatherization programs can be in places where people experience extreme cold and have inefficient insulation systems and um, heating air conditioning systems. So weatherization can save energy and save lives. So there's bad news and good news about climate change. Here's some of the bad news. We are currently seeing an unraveling of our environmental protections. There's been a rollback of the clean car standards, which are adhered to by 13 states. The National Environmental Protection Act uh, is, uh, efforts are being made to amend it and to change it and remove opportunities for input on projects that affect community health. There was a supplemental transparency um, effort in which there has been an attack on what was called secret science, was really real, which was really just an attack on science. The limits on particulate matter will remain at 12 micrograms per meter cubed, even though we now know that, um, that decreasing it would save many lives and protect many people. Mercury and air toxic rules that have been in effect for a number of years are being downgraded. And it was just announced that there would be a proposal to save the owners of pipeline companies hundreds of thousands of dollars per year by reporting fewer small oil spills. As a result of this, we are gonna to continue to see greenhouse gases rise and, um, and people endangered by environmental injustice. So climate change has caused uh, tremendous damage, which is costed out as you see here on this graph with the most recent years showing the greatest cost. The average line there is in gray and the most recent years 
are in, in white, pink, orange, and gold. And you can see that the costs of environmental disasters caused by climate are increasing dramatically. So what is the good news? It's really about clean, renewable energy, but we also know that it's possible that the public will now find out something more about what it means to flatten the curve. And this cartoon from a Washington Post cartoonist shows that very graphically. So the good news is that 30 states now have renewable portfolio standards and seven more have a voluntary target. 13 states, districts, and territories, and more than 200 cities and counties have committed to a 100% clean electricity target, and dozens of cities have already hit it. One of every three Americans live in a community that's committed to or achieved 100% clean electricity. So the evidence is growing that health is a highly influential way to talk about climate change, and health professionals are an excellent group to do that. Health is personal, and it turns out that the impact of climate change on people is also very personal. In addition, the moral imperative of intergenerational stewardship is quite close in influence to health as a way to talk about climate change. So if we're avoiding speaking about climate change to friends, family, and our community, we should be stressing health and intergenerational stewardship. These are topics that are easily shared and that have a great deal of impact, even on the more conservative end of the spectrum. So in, clo in closing, let me say that um, benefits to the health and the climate um, are really coming from the same source. Clean energy creates less, so less pollution and healthier air. Active transportation, including walking, biking, and public transportation is clean and better for our health. Diets with more vegetables and less meat are healthier and produce less methane and cause less climate damage. Cities with more trees and cooling greenery absorb more carbon dioxide and help protect people from heat. And intergenerational equity um, demands that we invest in policies that support building a healthy economy for the 21st century in a way that will create new jobs and a just transition for working people and communities adversely impacted by climate change and the transition to a low carbon economy. Finally, I just want to make you all aware of the clean, um, the, the call to action on climate health and equity, the policy action agenda, we call it. It's a 10 point plan for addressing climate change that you can find at climatehealthaction.org in which um, most of the policy prescriptions are also beneficial to health. So, these are some posters that we have at our website. You can find them at docsforclimate.org, docsforclimate.org, and um, you can share them in your offices uh, and public places. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Professor Sarafati. That was a terrific start to this program. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Renee Salas, year fellow with the Center for Climate, Health, and the Global Environment at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Dr. Salas. Renee, you're on mute. I think you're good right. now. Am I off now? Thank you. <laughs> Create a little technological issue uh, just to break up the, the mix. Um, thank you so much for having me. It's uh, wonderful to join this esteemed panel uh, to have this discussion. And I'd really like to use the next uh, 10 minutes that I have to reflect um, on some of the thoughts I've had on the uh, parallels, intersections, and the need for integrated solutions um, around the climate crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, that's sort of the outline that I uh, plan to um, proceed through. Um, but I really want to start with some personal reflections um, around the parallels. So I think everyone has their climate crisis story on when their sort of rose-colored glasses came off. Um, and they recognize what the implications were for the climate crisis, uh, not only for us, um, for our health, for our healthcare systems, um, but also for future generations. And so I sort of lay out here the, the five stages of grief, which I think is something at least that I personally went through in an accelerated fashion um, around the pandemic, um, but also something I went through around the climate crisis on a much longer uh, timetable. And I'm really struck by the parallels of how this accelerated pandemic 
um, has really created realizations. I know for my colleagues and I within a variety of, of clinical practices and, um, and healthcare institutions around uh, the US and across the globe about how fragile our healthcare systems are and the importance for resiliency and multidisciplinary and integrated solutions. But I think the big thing um, that I really wanna stress is the action. Um, and I think taking action, not only uh, for myself as an emergency medicine doctor, uh, practicing in my emergency department, but the action around the climate crisis is truly how we can move forward um, beyond the grief and fear of both um, events. And there's sort of three other parallels that I really would like to stress um, and really reiterate from Mona's talk. And these three parallels are the following. So health professionals have to use uh, their voices as trusted messengers. And I think the misinformation uh, campaign around the pandemic really rings eerily similar to what many climate scientists have faced for decades as they have been trying to sound the alarm bells. And I have seen my colleagues um, on TV really adding that human perspective to these often numbing statistics. And I think just reinforces that all of us in health related fields, whether that be nurses, doctors, pharmacists, um, or in the public health fields um, and all of the other affiliated fields, that we really have a unique uh, vantage point to disseminate information um, and this is something that the public desperately needs on both of these uh, crises. The second piece is that prevention has to be prioritized. We know that, you know, if a patient presents to my emergency department uh, struck with uh, COVID-19, we do not yet have a treatment. And so we provide supportive care just as with the ways that climate crisis harms health, as uh, Dr. Safdie outlined that many of those, we can't uh, truly remove the environmental uh, factors that are contributing to their illness. We send them back out into the world. And so we really need to think through how we can prevent both of these crises um, at its root, whether that be physical distancing and um, testing, tracing, and isolating in order to prevent uh, individuals from obtaining the disease or mitigation. Um, really decreasing greenhouse gas emissions and preventing the downstream health harms. And the third one is that we really need a rapid coordinated global response. And I think we as a health community at large are really the ones that need to call for this. Just as a mismanagement of the pandemic in one country uh, has ramifications around the globe into other countries, the same is true for greenhouse gas emissions. So the intersections, I think, are those that I'm, uh, you know, my work is really starting to center on um, as we sort of emerge uh, from the acute phase into recognizing what our future looks like going forward. And I think that that's recognizing that the climate crisis at its heart is a meta problem that underlines everything. And it's a threat multiplier um, across multiple spectrums. And so just like when I have trainees uh, come and say, well, what specialty should I focus in? Uh, if I want to work on climate change and I say, well, climate change touches everything and we need experts in every field. And so pick what's your passion. Um, and the same is true here that the climate crisis is impacting everything, including our response to the pandemic. And I think as was noted earlier around how the climate crisis disproportionately affects certain vulnerable populations. Um, the same has been true for certain populations for the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I think that that just shows uh, that we need to ensure we can build a world that is just um, and healthy for everyone. I'm also struck um, by the fact that just as uh, temperatures in a 1.5 degree Celsius warmer world, so we're at one degree Celsius approximately now, that you can look around the 75th percentile and how these temperature differences will change differently around the globe. Similarly, you can see where countries have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic in, in different uh, ways. And thus there are themes to our response, but we need to recognize that we need to take unique approaches and learn from one another, and especially individuals who are facing certain threats um, at an accelerated pace. So this is something I bring up because I think it's relevant, at least in the way that I've been thinking about this. And we really have had a movement, um, and this was launched through a uh, symposium we held in Boston in February for the clinical climate crisis and clinical practice symposium. 
And that's to really start thinking through how is the climate crisis impacting clinical practice and our ability to deliver healthcare. And one thing to note is that we, we recognize that the climate exposure pathways, especially in the United States, really differ by geographic region. And it has different impacts on practice depending on your specialty. All of this framed within your local healthcare infrastructure characteristics. And I would argue the same is true uh, for the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I know, you know different specialties have been experiencing uh, these effects in different ways with different impacts. So as we think about uh, you know, the broad pathways by which uh, we protect and improve health, everywhere from public health and prevention you know, to the actual the pre-hospital environment to the clinical practice environment within inpatient and outpatient um, services, and then thinking about sort of the larger uh, delivery uh, characteristics. Um, obviously, I don't have time to go through all of these in detail, but I sort of bring up one. So around the patient screening. So we have been screening patients um, for their ability to self-isolate at home if we are concerned that they may have COVID-19 or if they have come into contact with it. Similarly, we've been having discussions around screening from a climate crisis standpoint in regards to heat exposure and asking if people have access to um, air conditioners. Um, and if they have an air conditioner, can they afford to run one? Now, thinking about the intersection of both of these, we recognize that as we start to face uh, heat waves and increasing temperatures around uh, the US, if an individual doesn't have an ability to cool themselves within their apartment, are they gonna be able to remain isolated at home? And as we think about the widespread economic impacts, that have occurred across our nation and around the globe, are they gonna be able to afford to run their air conditioner even if they have it? And so I bring this up because we really need to start thinking about what some of these integrated solutions might be. From a healthcare delivery standpoint, this is something I uh, have a particular interest in. I also bring up the uh, issue around power outages. Um, and so this is actually an example from uh, just our own city. So Mount Auburn, actually had a power outage uh, in July, or I'm sorry, yes, in July of uh, 2019. And so it was about a 90 degree Fahrenheit day uh, then, and we know, and the National Climate Assessment outlines that we expect power outages to increase for a variety of reasons, increased demand, infrastructure um, uh, demands, uh, in regards as we experience more heat waves. And so there's actually this story um, that outlines sort of the narrative of what happened. And one thing they outlined is they actually had to move patients down after firefighters had to go up to the upper floors because it was so hot because backup generators only actually supply cooling to certain areas of the hospital. And so we also then think about, right, as a what an evacuation of that sort or an evacuation of a hospital after wildfires, what is that going to look like now having to have, um, you know, personal protective equipment um, and trying to ensure that we protect everyone from exposures. And secondly is the issue around supply chains. We know that supply chains have been impacting uh, different um, aspects and especially the example of intravenous fluids uh, following Hurricane Maria. And we know that we're already facing critical supplies of a variety of items that are mandated for the pandemic. So how can we make these more resilient? So I think all of this just really speaks to, and I look forward to the um, discussion we're going to have here today around the integrated solutions and adding not only now a climate lens, but also a COVID-19 pandemic lens uh, to all of the ways in which we need to build resiliency um, and improve our healthcare systems because we can no longer look in a rear view mirror in order to understand uh, what the future is. We're going to start having these um, uh, events now um, on top of one another. And what does it mean when you um, suddenly are facing a pandemic in addition to a heat wave, in addition to uh, extreme weather events? And so all of this, I think, is, is bridged around the idea of multidisciplinary collaboration uh, and the need to really bring different perspectives as we try to tackle the wide breadth of uh, action that we need from a climate perspective, but also from a pandemic perspective, because building resiliency for both will result in better health um, and improved future for all generations. So thank you so much for your time.
Thank you very much, Dr. Salas. It was outstanding. Uh, next up is Dr. Jalon White Newsom, who is a senior program officer at the Kresge Foundation. Jalon. Thank you and good afternoon. Let's see. Hopefully you can see. Yep, it's good. You're good? Okay, awesome. So thank you so much, uh, Dean and panelists. Um, I appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to be here. Um, again, my name is Jalon White Newsom, and I'm a senior program officer at the Kresge Foundation in southeastern Michigan. Um, and before I jump into my formal comments, I do want to acknowledge those of you who have experienced loss of health or loss of life due to the, pan due to the pandemic. Um, I want to appreciate those that continue to respond in our hospitals, those of you on this panel, those in grocery stores, other public health leaders, and of course, those in communities. Um, I also want to honor all the people that are not only responding to COVID or the climate threat, but the threat and reality of racism that pervades our country, our communities, and our systems that are supposed to take care of us. Um, but as we've witnessed, not only over the past 59 days of quarantine, but over multiple decades, the many systems we depend on, whether they be the education system, environmental protection system, justice system, insurance system, emergency response system, they have failed certain groups of people, particularly low-income communities, black and brown communities, and indigenous communities. And a system is literally a way of doing things, um, a set of connected things that work together that usually have some particular purpose. And yet it's really easy to see when systems are not working. So I think about my mom and many of her neighbors on the east side of Detroit that unfortunately last year about this time um, experienced extreme flooding. And as I speak to you now, her home is still unsafe because of that flooding and sewage backup that happened. And it was due to an inadequate, dilapidated, unresilient water system. And it's continued to cause her health problems, um, economic challenges, loss of personal items, definitely loss of her peace of mind. And particularly with a government system that says it's not her problem or it's not their problem. And so the systems have failed her and her neighbors immensely. And then I think about friends and family over the past several weeks that um, who were initially turned away from getting tested for COVID, a phenomenon that many of my family and friends of color have experienced. And even more disturbing was the lack of respect when they were admitted. And in some cases, strongly coerced to sign a do not resuscitate agreement right off the bat experiencing differential treatment depending on the zip code of the hospital they happen to be in. Again, the system has failed us. Now, we can all probably agree that when systems are stressed, um, just like us, things can fall through the cracks. They cannot be as efficient. They cannot always meet the needs of those that are most at risk. And so one of the reasons that our systems don't work is because they have been founded, built, created on racist policies and practices. And whether it's institutional racism, like racial profiling, communities having no insurance or environmental injustice, or structural racism that is kind of like the silent opportunity killer, these strongholds in our society are hard to tear down. But that's not an excuse. When systems fail, it's our job as researchers, as practitioners, as people who just care about life to learn from those failures and change systems so they can protect everyone more equitably, particularly as we begin to face multiple crises now and probably through the rest of 2020. So knowing what doesn't work is easy, but how do we know the indicators of a well-functioning system? And so I want you to think about right now, my home is a school and I have middle schoolers that are 11 and 13 and we've been talking a lot about immune systems. And so because I'm now like the, the pretend teacher in a way, um, I send them to TEDx talks. And one of the talks that uh, they've been really talking about, my girls, is the one on the immune system. And so as my 13 year old taught me uh, about what she learned from this TEDx talk about the immune system, um, I thought that this might provide us to in some insight into how systems should work. What is a well-functioning system? 
And so I'll start with what she schooled me on essentially. One, that immune systems attack germs to keep us healthy. Cells and organs work together to protect the body. That lymphocytes actually help the body remember the bad stuff that's coming into the body. They invade and they destroy them. Then certain lymphocytes make antibodies that connect with antigens that then fight disease. That immunizations can fight disease as well. And that some specialized cells can offer immunity, protecting our body against disease. So how do these elements of a working immune system offer learnings for us to better adapt our systems to climate change and other crises? Well, there's three things that I wanna posit. One, smart defense, finding the targets and locking them in. Two, getting to the root of the problem, which is again, attacking the germs. Partnership, cells and organs working together. Data, the body remembering who the invaders are. Resources, sometimes external like immunizations, and diversity and specialized cells. So to help illustrate these points, I wanna show some of the innovative work very quickly and leadership of some of our CRESI grantees that are engaged in really disrupting these systems of oppression in this multiple crisis environment. And I also offer some quotes directly from them. So let's start with smart defense. So again, the immune system attacks germs. And if we're gonna protect communities from multiple crises, smart, event, smart defense is about understanding where the threats are. So the Trust for Public Lands work, which is another organization that works in parks, has done many studies to understand that where there's limited park space, there is multiple climate threats, and oh, by the way, these areas tend to have higher percentages of low-income communities and communities of color. So again, this shows you where our defenses need to be targeted. An organization also called PolicyLink works on multiple issues and has now set forth principles centered on racial equity. That should be applied in this crisis and beyond. Again, smart defense needs to include principles and employ what I call an equity analysis to really become how, it should be a part of how we operate all of our systems and questions that we should ask before and after a crisis and in anything that we're trying to do, policy or response. Attacking the root of the problem. Groundwork USA is an organization that works across the country and in their National Climate Safe Healthy Neighborhoods program, they are trying to understand how racist policies, specifically redlining, were used to limit housing and availability of resources to people of color. Now what's interesting is that they've used GIS mapping to show how health disparities are also exacerbated, not only because of the redlining, but because of climate change impacts and bad policy. And so through their science and advocacy and community voice, they are working to change these systems by getting at the root of the problem. And on the West Coast, I want to lift up the Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition. And they're outside of Seattle. And organizations in this area have been addressing the root problem for a long time. Again, this community is a super fun site, have multiple polluting industries around them. And while much of their climate issues and much of our climate issues stem from man-made sources of pollution, the fact is that they have been having a fight since the crisis to compel the Environmental Protection Agency to not relax monitoring and reporting regulations for polluting industries in that community during the COVID crisis. And so that is definitely a system that they are working hard to change. But again, sometimes our source is the folks that are supposed to be protecting us. I want to talk about partnerships, again, like those cells and organs working together in our immune system. The Alliance of Nurses for a Healthy Environment is a national fellowship program working on building partnerships with community that are mutually beneficial and not extractive. Nurses are working on community-defined challenges. And let me say that again, the community is defining the challenges that they're working on. And they are learning to share power, expertise, and experience to build resilience and address systemic changes. Data. Now we all know if we don't have good data, our response will continue to be inequitable and inefficient. And we've seen, unfortunately, in both the COVID and the climate crisis, that if we don't disaggregate data by race and gender, if we don't use data to identify hot spots of COVID or repeated climate events, and if we don't understand where the resources flow, like potential stimulus funds, the system will continue to fail people. 
And so this is shown both by the Urban Systems Lab in New York, again, using their power to pull together social vulnerability, COVID and climate data, and then an effort again, that is really focused on counting everybody and not leaving anybody invisible. Let's talk about resources, particularly around water infrastructure and the health infrastructure, but we'll start with the water infrastructure. Resources, again, are immunizations. They're external additions to our body. And so we need external resources like financing and engineering to support critical invisible infrastructure like our water systems. They need to be maintained in the COVID crisis and maintained in a flood. Water is critical, and we must make sure that the systemic barriers that keep emergency resources, particularly funding for infrastructure, stimulus funding, and recovery, they're things that keep these funds from reaching the hardest hit communities. How can we remove those barriers? A similar set of resources are needed to sure up our undervalued infrastructure of community health workers. These are national networks of folks and cities that are on the front line, literally really delivering human service resources, but are now being deployed to respond to COVID. In our case, we're supporting the Michigan Community Health Worker Alliance to really be deployed for climate issues as well. So how do we make sure that we fund them too? Diversity. Again, we think about the specialized cells in our body that help maintain our immune system. I think about the Healthy Schools campaign in Chicago. And so while this team has specialized in addressing uh, climate flooding and reducing flooding in schools in Chicago's poorest neighborhoods, they are addressing a diversity of issues connected to COVID, food insecurity, resource extraction, education. And they're using their specialized skills to strengthen the failing system for low-income communities and parents in Chicago neighborhoods. And in fact, the Fairmount Indigo Collaborative in Boston said it well, the COVID crisis has really allowed them to expand their connections and diversify their solution set from housing to climate change. So again, let's make sure that we identify and learn from our present system failures so that we can actually rethink, reimagine, and in some cases, radically change our current systems during and after the COVID crisis so we can better protect human health and human dignity. So thank you. That was uh, wonderful, thank you. Uh, as you could see in the chat, there were a lot of people uh, giving the uh, talk many thumbs up while you were speaking, thank you. Um, uh, next up is Professor Greg Willenius, Professor of Environmental Health here at Boston University School of Public Health. Greg. Great, thank you. Okay, great. You can see my presentation? Yep. Yeah. Great, thank you. So thank you to uh, uh, my co-panelists. It's a real privilege and honor to be on the same virtual stage with you. And thank you to all the participants uh, tuning in. Uh, so we've heard uh, a, a lot about climate and health today, and it's a lot of great information. And um, we know from an immense body of literature now that climate change threatens, threatens the way we live, work, and play. And you've heard already about a number of the environmental hazards and threats to our ecosystems, but then how that translates into impacts on things that we care about every day. So injury and death being the most visible, but also uh, uh, more subtle uh, uh, harmful effects on our physical and mental health, destruction of property, destruction or damage to our infrastructure, huge economic losses, uh, and overall how these factors build together to influence our quality of life. And I'll just give a shout out to the fourth national climate assessment put out by uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, US Global Change Research Program. This is a federal agency, and this is just a terrific document to highlight how in each area of the US, in each of the, the six or, or seven regions that, that it's divided into, how the climate change in your neighborhood is affecting your health and the things that you care about 
today and into the future. So I encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, so until, well, let's say about January of this year, uh, there was, uh, I would describe the climate and health research agenda as uh, uh, fairly robust and uh, focused on, on the topics you see here. So broadly, we were trying as a community to understand the impact of climate hazards on human health. And we were essentially looking at a, a range of, of uh, these climatic hazards uh, and their direct and indirect effects on, on things that we care about every day. And I think we were doing a pretty good job of that, uh, better for some hazards than for others. So we know a lot about the health impacts of extreme heat, uh, less so about hurricanes and severe storms and repeated floodings. Uh, we know some of the impacts of wildfires, but not others. And we're just starting to think about the, the health impacts of, of long-term drought. Uh, and another part of the research agenda that's very important is to identify those individuals and the communities at greatest risk. And this varies for individual level factors like special populations. We're interested in pregnant women, children, and the elderly, uh, as, as well as others, outdoor workers, uh, uh, as well as uh, several community factors. And we often talk about the social determinants of health that uh, make up so much of what constitutes our, our opportunity to lead healthy uh, lives and, and, and maximize our health is really determined by the conditions in, in the places where we live. And so we're starting to look, uh, there's many people that look carefully at the interactions uh, between the social determinants of health and the, how that poses a, uh, inc uh, an additive or multiplicative risk factor for uh, the, the impacts of climate hazards. And Another part of the agenda was to develop uh, the approaches to minimize the risks of climate events and climate hazards, uh, minimize those risks today and into the future. And at the same time, make investments that helps us maximize the co-benefits. These are the, the steps that we take to reduce the risks of climate change into the future have immediate health benefits today. So, uh, so we don't need to wait 20 or 50 years to see the benefits of climate action. We can see them uh, today. But this research agenda happens uh, within a, a context that's uh, very important. So the hazards are the things like hurricanes and days of extreme heat. And then even when a hazard occurs, not everybody is equally exposed uh, and not everybody is uh, equally vulnerable. Uh, uh, and, and that incorporates the resilience to recover from an adverse event. And so it's the intersection of the hazards, the exposure and the vulnerability that leads to the risk and, and the health impacts that we think from that. And of course, these systems are, are highly interconnected uh, uh, with um, uh, adaptation, mitigation, governance, et cetera. Uh, so COVID-19 is, is, uh, has deeply changed the context in which we live. So as we all know, and, and all too painfully, uh, social distancing is the norm now, and uh, uh, some level of social distancing seems likely for the foreseeable future. Uh, this has meant, uh, of course, much more time at home, fewer trips to uh, places of work, Childcare uh, has been less available for, for many of us. Um, there's, of course, very high levels of unemployment, and this is imposing currently and into the foreseeable future a great deal of economic hardship. So what does that have to do with climate change? Uh, well, people uh, may have, for instance, this summer, uh, less access to air conditioning. Uh, that would be because uh, uh, many of us uh, work in, in uh, uh, commercial buildings that have air conditioning. So whether we're in retail outlets or restaurants or office buildings, uh, there's access, uh, for many people, there's access to air conditioning at work. And if we're not going to work, we might not have that access. Uh, at home instead, uh, the, uh, in a setting of uh, um, economic hardship, there may be less money to uh, even operate air conditioning, even if you do have it. So there might be less access to air conditioning, which then we think puts people at greater risk of experiencing the adverse health effects of heat. Uh, housing and food insecurity is going to be much more common or already is much more common and will continue to be so. There's going to be these impacts of the pandemic on physical health and on mental health. And all this sort of builds to individuals that are more likely to be exposed and uh, more likely to be vulnerable to the impacts of uh, these climate uh, hazards. 
at the same time, there's fewer community resources. I see this in my community and it's uh, seen visible across the country. Uh, the, our community resources are uh, strained and uh, uh, appropriately focused on uh, reducing the adverse impacts of the pandemic. So there are fewer resources left to dedicate to um, uh, additional stressors in the environment. That makes for less resilient communities. So the challenges posed uh, by COVID, uh, uh, I would summarize like this. So the hazards that we're experiencing, the storms, the heat, the wildfires, those aren't going away. Those are, are coming uh, in, in our country. It's going to be here, you know, shortly with uh, the the heat, heating season or high heat season summers. Um, exposures of individuals uh, will be amplified and individual individuals and communities we think will be more vulnerable and less resilient. Uh, government agencies and healthcare systems are already strained uh, and uh, again appropriately focused on the pandemic response, uh, but that's going to leave less room and less resources available for uh, adapting to additional uh, stressors. Many of the adaptive measures that are currently in place uh, to protect people during climate events are, uh, may carry now new risks. So in the summer, uh, many cities and, and towns will open cooling centers and encourage or even help people get to those cooling centers so that these are places with air conditioning where people can, can go to get, it, get out of the heat for a while. And now in the setting of, uh, uh, of the novel coronavirus that carries new risks and you have to think rethink whether uh, having a cooling center is a good idea and how you would uh, operate it to uh, minimize the, the compound risks there. Same thing for evacuation for hurricanes or wildfires. The strategies that we've been using uh, will need to be rethought to uh, maximize uh, uh, protection from the climate hazard at the same time as protecting people from uh, the spread of the virus. Similarly, the healthcare industry uh, will need to uh, consider and adapt new strategies for responding to mass casualties in the uh, context where anybody that you come into contact with may be in fact infected. Uh, so there's, I already mentioned, there's less social capital and communities uh, may be less resilient. So that really calls for, these challenges call for a rethinking of our research agenda. Uh, and it's the, 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 the research agenda broadly, I think, stays the same, but now we need to uh, uh, focus on these contextual factors that are so different now. So yes, we can still quantify and should quantify the health impacts of climate hazards today, but then we have an opportunity to compare those impacts uh, uh, as we assess them today to how they were um, to to our, the what we assess them to be yesterday or in, in the past several years, and now we maybe can learn something about our risk and our uh, uh, how to properly adapt to those risks. Um, COVID nineteen might in fact amplify climate risks. Uh, so there are there's a, a tie in between uh, uh, the vulnerability caused by the infection uh, or the risk of infection and, and our policies to mitigate the risk of infection and how does that exacerbate our, our risk to climate events and and vice versa. Do, there's some evidence uh, emerging and a lot more work to be done, but that in fact uh, uh, that the state of the environment may in fact uh, uh, amplify our risk to COVID-19. So uh, we still need to identify people and communities that are at greatest risk, uh, but uh, we should now focus on factors that are modifiable uh, so that we can actually work towards solutions and also relevant to COVID-19 risk because as already mentioned, uh, there's a considerable overlap in the risk to uh, climate hazards and risk to, to infections. A lot of the same communities are the worst uh, impacted. And we need to continue to develop new strategies, but in a setting where uh, we're promoting strategies that are based on, on evidence, that are uh, local and customized. So there's not a one size fits all package here. We need to work community by community to uh, develop new adaptive strategies. 
at the same time, uh, with these challenges, there's opportunities to uh, really learn something and, and perhaps even to create healthier, more sustainable communities. So uh, we've seen in many places, you've seen uh, improvements in air quality since uh, 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 people's movements have been constrained. So yes, it's possible to lower, uh, uh, to improve air quality, lower air pollution. There's far fewer traffic accidents, less traffic noise. Uh, there's lower carbon emissions, you know, maybe as much as six, uh, six percent or so this year. So it is possible to make gains in environment. Uh, but then we have to, obviously the current level isn't sustainable, the current uh, uh, approach isn't sustainable. So uh, we can learn from this unfortunate experiment what works and what doesn't. So uh, maybe instead of all of us going back to work at the same time, maybe there uh, will uh, learn that working remotely has its benefits and has a place in it. Education uh, will, we have been forced to adapt to how we educate and to uh, have more remote education. So many of these changes can be good, can be advantageous, and uh, used judiciously may help us create healthier, more sustainable communities. Uh, and lastly, there's going to be, uh, uh, there already has been, and there's likely going to continue to be uh, substantial investment uh, 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 and financial stimulus. And let's take this as an opportunity uh, to uh, change, um, not only sort of invest in our infrastructure and systems, but also to uh, invest with the specific goal of creating more livable communities. So uh, uh, the emerging lessons, it's really too, too soon to say what we've learned because it, we're still in the thick of it, but uh, uh, this point I made before that hazards remain the same, exposures uh, will likely be amplified, vulnerabilities exacerbated and resilience of communities compromised. And what I think the crisis than the pandemic has exposed is that complacency and underinvestment in public health system uh, really does untold damage. And we don't know what's going to come next, but we know something's going to come next. And we're not nearly as prepared as we may have thought. Climate hazards are uh, uh, here already and going to continue to increase in frequency and severity. And we, uh, it would be useful to take a page from this example and uh, learn how we can do better. Uh, and I'll finish up with uh, uh, just as we prepare for the future, uh, the, the threat to human health from continued climate change is ever more important. It's, it's not less important today. I would argue it's even more important in, in this context. And that we see that we have to make these investments in science, public health, and medicine in order to minimize the impacts of the future expected and unexpected disasters. And this looks like investing in infrastructure, uh, that's both physical infrastructure and public health infrastructure, investing in knowledge uh, through funding of research and science, training people, we'll call that teams, but we need a, a educated, a talented, dedicated workforce to continue to work on these problems. And all that translates into solutions for COVID, for climate change, and for whatever else is going to come next. I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you very much. That was outstanding with an outstanding series of uh, presentation. Um, um, I'm aware of the time, but I, I, I would like to, and many questions have been answered in the, in the chat as we've been talking, but I do want to ask one key question, maybe even go around with answers for everybody. Um, one learning, what's the one key learning from the time of COVID-19 that you think we can best apply to the much longer arc challenge of climate change? Maybe we can go, Greg, you want to go first? Yeah, so I, I, I think that the, the most valuable lesson here is that we really have to be prepared to expect the unexpected, prepare for disasters and threats to both our uh, health and our way of life. Uh, and we don't know what that shape is going to be. So we just have to invest in uh, having the, the public health infrastructure, having the workforce, having uh, and educating the public and getting them on board with how important um, uh, these investments are. So, so I think that what this has shown us is that it's not enough to invest in these things during a time of crisis. We need to invest these things continuous in, in the infrastructure continuously so that we're better prepared for the next emergency. Jalon. Yeah, I agree with Greg. We are still learning a lot, but what I will say is don't be afraid of radical reformation. Mm -hmm. Like, don't just get so used to how we've done it. Let's not go back to how we've done it, the, the normal. Um, you know, this is a time if something is working 
and we've had to tweak the system or change it in some way to be more responsive, then we can actually keep that. <laughs> we can keep going. Paid sick leave is a good thing. Um, wiping down movie theaters after each show is a good thing. Like some basic stuff we should have been doing a long time ago. So I'm like, let's just, let's just disrupt and blow things up for the better. So that is what I hope we learn from this. That's pretty awesome. Um, uh, Dr. Salas, Renee. Well, I love it. I'm all with you. Let's blow it up. Um, but I think the, uh, the other piece that I want to bring up is the fact that what is lacking um, for both the climate crisis and the pandemic right now is political will. We have the solutions. The solutions are mapped out, but we just need to act. And so from my unique perspective as an emergency medicine physician and a public health perspective, we need, in order, we need to engage the health community to step forward, combat the misinformation, and join in unison to say that we need to act. Here's the plan. Um, and I think that that is how we will um, address both of these crises in time. Excellent. Thank you. Mona. Mona, are you, uh, I know you're there, but you've been, you've been uh, texting, uh, answering people's questions. There I go. Sorry. I, I guess I was um, on mute. You can hear me now? Yeah, gotcha now. yeah, okay. So I agree about the preparedness and prevention. They're essential, especially building out our public health system back to some reasonable level of function. It was very hard hit after the crisis of 2008, 2009. We lost a huge number of public health jobs, and it's really showing up now in the way that it's compromised the ability of localities to respond to COVID-19. So we have to prepare, build back, uh, and when this crisis is over and we're working on rebuilding the economy, we can't go back to the way it was before. We have to build to better. We have to build a better future. And I'd like to emphasize as a part of that building a better future that we have to clean the air because we've seen all too clearly that in places that are already breathing polluted air, the fatality rate uh, from COVID-19 is greater. And it's not just here in the United States, it's been shown to be true in Italy, and it's been shown to be true across a number of countries in Europe. So we have to get our uh, air pollution under control. We've got to clear the air, and to clear the air, we've got to reduce the emissions that are coming from our fossil fuel generating uh, activities. So I would end with that. What a, what a wonderful set of responses for really echoing the talks. I. Um... I think we could talk for another hour, but we're going to respect the time. And I want to say thank you very much to all our panelists for a really outstanding uh, set of presentations. And thank you to the audience who participated. And the, there's been quite a lively uh, chat going back and forth with questions and answers. Um, uh, everybody, thank you for what you're doing during this time. Stay well, stay healthy. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>